Hi there, it's really lovely to welcome you to our Going Deeper service from St George's Church in Stamford. My name is Richard Knowles and I'm part of the staff team at St George's and I'm really excited to be able to share with you this morning the next in our series on the one and other commands in the New Testament and I have been given this morning encourage one another so I'm really hoping that I can encourage you that we can encourage one another as a result of what we're studying this morning. Let's pray as we come to God's word. Lord God, we thank you so much that you love to encourage your people and you want to build your kingdom in us as you encourage us. We pray that as we listen this morning, that we would be encouraged to keep on encouraging one another and build each other up and that we would be able to go out and do that for your glory and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. So the theme verse that I've been given is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11. It says this, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. And as we start this, I want to just ask you this question. How are you feeling in lockdown? Are you feeling encouraged or are you discouraged by what you see going on around you? Here's another question. What would it take for you to feel encouraged right now? What might need to happen? And if you were to be encouraged, what effect would that have on you, do you think? How about encouraging others? How could you encourage others? And what effect might that have on them? I want you to consider this question. Who has had the biggest positive influence in your life. Just pause to let you think who that person is. Maybe it was a teacher, a coach, a parent or a family member who called out the best things in you. Perhaps it was an, an older Christian, someone who nurtured you as you were young in the faith. But I'm almost certain that they all have this one thing in common, that they are people who encouraged you and that they are people who believed, maybe still believe, I hope that's the case, still believe in you. Um, I was listening this week uh, with the uh, follow-on group from an Alpha course that, that Lorraine and I did recently um, to a series um, by a guy called Mark Aldridge. He's one of the, the, the trainers from New Wine, and he has run a course called Learning to Hear God's Voice, and we're doing that with that group. Um, and he shared this story that there was a certain teacher at school, he was quite a rebellious child at school, didn't really concentrate on his lessons, didn't, didn't do the things that you would hope as a pupil would do. Uh, but there was a certain teacher who really understood that he loved football and who just kind of made a real effort to talk to him about football, ask him about the things that he liked, give him special kind of um, reward stickers that were all to do with football. And he really wanted to work for that teacher because that teacher took the time, made the effort to encourage him and believed in him. And encouragement makes such a difference. Our text says this, encourage one another, build each other up just as in fact you are doing. And of course, as with all good Bible study, um, the first thing that we need to do is to put this text into context. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the context of this verse to understand why it's in the Bible and what it meant for the people who were reading it, and therefore what it means for us. And then I'm going to take you through two examples, one in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament, where we see the power of encouragement at work. So let's look at the context. The beginning of the verse, it says, therefore, encourage one another. And of course, we must always ask, if there's a therefore, what's the therefore? Therefore. Well, this letter was written by Paul to the church in Thessalonica. It was a church that he himself had, had started and had, had begun. And we see that story in Acts, um, Acts chapter 17. It's Paul's second missionary journey uh, when they go to Macedonia. And that church was birthed in the context of suffering and persecution. Um, there was... Uh, Paul went to the synagogue, he preached the gospel, but there was very soon opposition, particularly from the Jews, to the gospel. 
uh, and they caused, uh, they, they got together a mob, they caused a riot in the marketplace and Paul had to flee from Thessalonica and he went to Berea, the next town further south. Um, but the Jewish opponents followed him there and caused trouble there and he had to flee twice. He had to leave Berea and head to Athens. And so this church was birthed in the midst of suffering and that sounds familiar. We, we are a church living in the midst of suffering right now. But Paul writes this letter to encourage the Thessalonian Christians in that uh, fledgling church that he had um, planted. He wants to write to encourage them. And he reminds them of the visit that he, he had made at the, the time that he planted the church and all of the opposition that they faced. If we look at, in chapter one, it says this, verse six, you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering, but they welcomed it with joy given by the Holy Spirit. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse two says this, we had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi. That was the town that, that Paul was in previously before he came to Thessalonica. But with the help of God, we, tell, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. So there we have suffering and opposition. That's the context in which the church was birthed and the, the context in which that church was still living. And Paul reminds them of the gospel that he preached to them. And he models encouragement not only when he was with them, but also now in his letter. So if we look at uh, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, it says, You know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. There's a challenge for us as fathers. Are we encouraging, comforting, and urging our children to live lives worthy of God? In chapters 2 and 3, Paul speaks of how he longs to see the Thessalonians um, but he's prevented from doing so. He, he, he can't get to see them. He's separated from them. That again resonates with us in this season. In fact, I shared that uh, those chapters with our small group leaders um, in our meeting the other day. That we long to see each other um, and yet we, we can't. There's something that's preventing us. So what does Paul do? Well, he sends somebody else. He sends Timothy, his faithful co-worker, to encourage the Thessalonian church. In 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 2, he says this, we sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. I don't know about you. Are you unsettled by the trials that you're currently going through? Well, God wants to send people to us to encourage us. I hope that I'm here to encourage you. And Paul models that. He sends Timothy to encourage um, the Thessalonian church. Uh, despite the trials that they're going through. And Paul, in turn, is encouraged by the report that Timothy brings back. And notice there's this cycle of encouragement. He, he sends Timothy to encourage them, and then, and then Timothy comes back with a good report, uh, and he's encouraged himself. Verse 7 of chapter 3 says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. I wonder... If somebody was to do a report on, on how it's going in our church or how it's going in, in our own lives, would they send back an encouraging report? There's a challenge to us. And Paul then tells them of his prayers for them. He encourages them through prayer, but he also encourages them to live in a way that pleases God. That, that's in chapter four. Um, and he then commends them for their love for each other. Again, encouraging them with what they're doing well. He says this, now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. We urge you, brothers and sisters, to do this more and more. So Paul commends them. That's another way of encouraging them. And he says, do more of it. And we come towards the end of the, the letter and uh, we start moving to this um, section where Paul is encouraging them despite people who are Christians dying and they're wondering what's going on, why have these people died? Wasn't Jesus going to come back and kind of rescue them? So, And then he's talking about the day of the Lord, the, the end of, of, of time when the Lord will come back. And he wants to encourage them firstly with the hope of the resurrection. Chapter 4 verse 1 says, encourage one another with these words that Jesus is coming back and we will meet him in the air to be with him in his kingdom. And then he turns his attention to the last days, and that's where the verse that we have comes. And it says this, brothers and sisters, 
about the times and dates we do not read to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It's going to be sudden when Jesus comes back. But Paul basically says this, we don't need to worry about it. We don't need to worry about when it is, and we don't need to be afraid. If you're worrying about the trials that you're going through, and about what God is doing through all this, and whether he's going to come and rescue us, you don't need to worry. You don't need to be afraid. Why? Well, because if we have trusted in Jesus, as it says in this section in uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through to 11, we're not in darkness, but we are in light. In other words, we're not ignorant, but we are informed of what God is going to do. And we are on the right side. We're in the light. We're on the good side, the winning side. And we shouldn't be surprised but we should be expectant. Jesus is coming and we need to be ready and we should be expecting that with joy. We shouldn't be asleep, but we should be alert. There's no need to be worried that we're not prepared, but actually we've been equipped with the armour of God. Paul talks about um, faith and love as, as a breastplate and salvation as a helmet, another reference to the armour of God, but in a slightly different way here. Why do we not need to be afraid? Because we have hope. That's the key point. We have hope in the midst of suffering and persecution that the Thessalonians were still going uh, through. We're reminded in verse 5 that we are children of light if we've trusted in Jesus. That we belong to the day, verse 8. That we are recipients of salvation, verse 9. We've been saved. And he died, verse 10, so that we might live. I want to ask you, do you know that? That you, if you've trusted in Jesus, are a children of the light, that you belong, you're a child of the light, sorry, you belong to the day, that you've received salvation, you have been saved, and Jesus died so that you might have life. Therefore, you don't need to be afraid. And with these truths, you can encourage yourself and each other. Therefore, it says, encourage one another. So that's the context. Hope in spite of suffering and persecution. Here are some examples, and I want to make three points today. Um, my first point says this, encouragement comes from God. Encouragement comes from God. Encouragement is God's way of doing life. God never starts with judgment or criticism. Remember, Jesus says, do not judge or you will be judged. No, encouragement is God's way of calling out the best in us. I think encouragement does four things. It sets us free from fear. It brings true identity, what you might call God esteem, not just self-esteem, but esteem that comes from God, God esteem. It speaks strength and it releases potential. Let me say that again. It sets you free from fear. It brings true identity. It speaks strength and it releases potential. One of my favourite examples of this, my first worked example is from the Old Testament and it's the story of Gideon. Um, in Judges chapter 6 and verse 11 to 16 we read this, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. The Midianites are their enemies, they're strong, and Gideon is hiding. He's threshing wheat in a wine press. You're not meant to do it in a wine press. So he's afraid. He's hiding from the Midianites. So in that context of fear, the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and he said, The Lord is with you, mighty Warrior, notice he is bringing a new identity to Gideon. Gideon is a fearful man, but the Lord says, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. That's God's esteem, God's identity for him. Gideon doesn't understand, he says, Pardon, my Lord, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? I wonder if that's the question you're asking. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt, but the Lord has abandoned us. But the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have 
and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? You see, God speaks strength into Gideon here. He's saying, yes, add your strength to my strength and you will have all the strength that you need. Gideon still is not really understood. He says, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. He's still got low self-esteem, but the Lord says, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. You see, he's set free from fear. Gideon is hiding and yet he discovers his true identity, that he is a mighty warrior. And he, God speaks strength, go in the strength you had. In other words, your strength plus my strength will be real strength. And God releases potential in Gideon. We discover through the rest of the story that he defeats a mighty army, thousands of men with just 300. You see, God believes in you more than you believe in yourself. That's always his way. God said to Gideon, I am with you and together we can do this. If God is with us, then nothing and no one can stand against us. And he wants to do the same for you. He wants to set you free from fear. Are you fearful today? Let God speak strength into you. He wants to speak true identity into you. Let these words that you are loved, you are precious, that if you have trusted in him, you are a child of God, you are a mighty warrior. Let them speak strength into you. If you add your strength to his strength, you have all you need because his strength is greater than anything else. It doesn't matter how weak our strength is. If he is with us, then we are strong. And he wants to release your potential. He wants you to become the you that he created, the you that he delighted over when he made you in that secret place. Not just with your natural gifts that he's given you, but with spiritual gifts that he wants to give you too. I discovered that psychologists say for every one discouragement, we need seven encouragements to pick us back up again and to strengthen us. Let me say that again. For every one discouragement, we need seven made the screen wobble, sorry. We, may, we need seven encouragements. Now, I don't know about you, but lockdown is probably a discouragement. So here goes, you need seven encouragements. I think this is more than seven, but I'm going to speak some truth over you. You are loved. You are precious. God made you and he believes in you. He believes in you so much that he didn't want his precious child to face fear or judgment or brokenness or rejection or shame. And so he sent Jesus, his beloved son, to die for you, to take away your sin and your shame, and by his death to bring you life. And so if you put your trust in him, and as you put your trust in him, you can be called a child of God, a child of the light. You belong to the day. You've been saved and equipped to serve him. He sees great potential in you, and he wants to release it in you and for you to flourish as you serve him. He sees you as a mighty warrior, a polished arrow in his quiver, a sword in his hand, a holy messenger, a gifted leader, an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a shepherd or a teacher, a great helper, a wonderful administrator, a hard worker, a fabulous artist, an inspirational creator, an innovator, an encourager or motivator, a skillful worship leader, one who could bring his love, his hope, his joy, his peace, his reconciliation and his healing wherever you go with his help. I'm quite sure one of those is for you. You know which one it is and the Lord wants to speak it into your life. Sometimes he uses other people to encourage us by calling those things out in us. Sometimes he uses a prophetic word. Um, there's a prophetic word that was spoken over me at the age of 25 that is the reason that I am here today, that God said one of those things that I've just mentioned in that list over me and I'm still pressing in I need him to remind me of it often, but I'm still pressing in because of that encouragement. I just want to contrast encouragement with criticism for a second. Um, when I was probably 13, I played rugby in the school team. Um, I wasn't brilliant at rugby, but I was a very fast runner, as you might already know. But I wasn't particularly skillful. And I had a certain teacher who was the coach for the rugby team that year 
who just he, he was just constantly criticizing me from from the edge of the pitch he was like Knowles what are you doing why are you running that way you're, you're useless basically and and guess what I played really badly that year I really struggled it, actually I needed my teammates to encourage me um, I went on to be a much better rugby player um, when people encouraged me and I just wonder are we doing that to other people are we, are we criticizing them are we slating them from the side of the pitch what's that like in church are you on the sidelines of church criticizing and slating people what is it that you're shouting are you shouting encouragement are you saying come on that was a brilliant pass uh, yeah, come on, you can do this. You can you can do a sidestep and, and score a try. Are you shouting encouragement? Are you encouraging the players on the pitch? Or better still, have you got off the bench? And have you started playing? And maybe you realise at that point um, that the people on the pitch need encouragement because you need it too. See, God made you to play. And he you need encouragement. Encouragement calls courage out of people. That's why it's called encouragement. When it's somebody else's turn to be the player on the pitch, are you cheering them on? Notice I've said God is our encourager. Encouragement comes from him and the Holy Spirit, of course, is our perfect encourager. Um, John chapter 14 verse 16, Jesus says this, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The word advocate is sometimes translated comforter, but it could just as easily be translated encourager because that's actually the same root word as the word encourage in our passage. Um, you might have heard the word paraclete. That is what is used in that verse, and that's the same verb, parakaleo. It means to call out alongside. That's what it is. It's, it's like shouting encouragement from the side of the pitch. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us. He shouts encouragement. He cheers us on. He comes alongside to help and encourage. Paul, of course, uh, shows us the example of how to encourage through his letter. We saw, it, we saw that already. Um, but even more so, of course, Jesus is the ultimate example. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16, we read this. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself... And God the Father, who loved us by his grace and gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. You see, Jesus did the ultimate act of encouragement for you on the cross. You don't need to fear judgment because of what he did. If you put your trust in him, your sins, the judgment that you deserve, has been taken away. And your true identity is so precious that Jesus was willing to die for you. That's your identity, that you are precious. And he was willing to give himself for you. He wants to give you his strength. He wants to give you his life. And he wants to release your potential. John 10 verse 10, a very famous verse, says this, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's the critical spirit. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus wants you to have life to the full. So point number one, encouragement comes from God. Point number two, encouragement builds up God's people. You see, the second part of the verse says, encourage one another and build one another up. And here's my next example, a New Testament example the story of Barnabas. Barnabas in the book of Acts chapter 4 verse 36 we're first introduced to him um, we're told that his real name is Joseph um, I was delighted to, to be reminded of that my own son is uh, one of my own sons is called Joseph and he was apparently a Levite from Cyprus and he got called Barnabas that was his nickname what a wonderful nickname to have it means son of encouragement make that your ambition that your nickname is to be Barnabas uh, he's mentioned because he brought a gift. He's a generous man. Um, and then we see him next in Acts chapter 9. And after Saul is um, converted on the road uh, to Damascus, he um, goes to Jerusalem, tries to join the disciples, but they're afraid of him. They didn't really believe that he was a disciple. They thought, he was, they thought it was a trick. But it's Barnabas who takes Saul and takes him to the apostles. And he tells them how Saul has seen the Lord 
and have his preached in the name of Jesus, and so they accept him. And then Paul is released to speak boldly. Uh, or Saul, who becomes Paul, is released to speak boldly in the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 11, Barnabas um, goes to, he's sent by the Jerusalem church to check up and make sure that the converts in, in the town of Antioch are doing okay and that they're following the, the right ways. And then he's sent back from Antioch with a gift to Jerusalem to help the struggling church in Jerusalem when there's a famine. So Barnabas is trusted to, to, to encourage and check up on people um, and he's tr entrusted with large sums of money. Um, and then uh, in Acts chapter 12, we see him being set apart for mission with Paul in, the, in, in Antioch. There's a prophecy and Paul and Barnabas are sent off on the first missionary journey. And so he accompanies Paul throughout Turkey, uh, modern day Turkey, preaching the gospel, uh, planting churches. And in Acts chapter 15, he accompanies Paul back to Jerusalem to defend the Gentile believers at the Council of Jerusalem. And then he's sent back with Paul uh, with the letter that is written by that council. So he's defending the Gentiles. And then in Acts chapter 15, the last time that we really come across him in the book of Acts, Paul does not want to take a guy called John Mark with him because he deserted him previously on his next missionary journey. But Barnabas still believes in John Mark. He's willing to take the risk of somebody who's not got everything perfectly right and he encourages him and they go off and they go to Cyprus where Paul and Silas go on the second missionary journey. And so what if Barnabas had not done all of these things? Paul wouldn't have been released into his ministry or Saul would have, wouldn't have become Paul and done the amazing missionary work that he did. There wouldn't be a church in Antioch. There wouldn't have been a gift for the Jerusalem church. There wouldn't have been a first missionary journey that was as successful as it was. There wouldn't have been Gentiles accepted into the church. In other words, none of us could have been in the church. Um, John Mark would not have been still useful to the gospel. In fact, at that point, the gospel reached doubled because you had one group in Cyprus and another group on the second missionary journey. So that leads me to my third point. Encouragement builds God king, God's kingdom. Encouragement builds God's kingdom. Because just think how much the gospel spread as a result of everything that Barnabas did and how God's kingdom grew. We are here as a result of what Barnabas did. And as we approach yet further into the, the call of the resource church, this is going to be absolutely vital for us as a church. By encouraging people, we will combat fear and hasten progress. I just want to remind you of the story of the 12 spies in the book of Numbers. And Joshua and Caleb believed that God would be with them and came back with an encouraging report. But there are 10 other spies who were discouraging. And of course, the people of Israel, as a result of that, wandered for 40 years in the desert. That slowed down the progress of the people of God. So if, if we're encouraging, we will combat fear and hasten progress of the kingdom. By encouraging, we will strengthen our present leaders. And they really need our encouragement as they go into battle and perhaps are at the, on the front line of the battle for us. By encouraging, we will release potential. Um, I was on a church planting conference this week, and uh, it was so important that we release new leaders. We grow new leaders. We release potential. We need to send new leaders to the church plants. We need to grow new leaders in our own church to take their place and to, to strengthen our church. The, the, the kind of the mother church, as it were. So we need people to be growing and be released in their potential. That's how we do it, through encouraging, through spotting and encouraging what is good and getting alongside to support. By encouraging, we will demonstrate God's heart and Jesus's love to the world outside and win more people to Christ. And the last part of our theme verse says this, encourage one another just as in fact you are doing. So I want to challenge you. Are we doing it? Are you doing it? Am I doing it? In our home group, for example, we have a really lovely couple. I won't embarrass them, but they are so great at encouraging us. They encourage those of us when we say we're struggling with our parenting. They say, no, you're doing a great job. 
they encourage those of us, uh, myself on the, on the staff team, they're saying, you're doing a great job. Uh, these people are doing a great job. They're so encouraging. Are you like that? I really want to be like that as I, as I grow older as a Christian, that I encourage younger believers. Um, there are several people in my life, several couples, um, who I can think of in my previous church and also in, in St George's, who've been so encouraging to me. I, I'm really grateful for the, the emails and letters and cards that I've had recently um, encouraging me as I go on my journey towards ordination. Are we doing that for others? Are we encouraging younger Christians? Ask yourself this question, are you mentoring somebody? Are you getting alongside somebody to encourage them? What do you see in others that you can name and call out and speak encouragement over them? What can you encourage them in? And what about those outside of the church? How do you speak encouragement into the lives of the people that you mix with day by day in your workplace, your colleagues, your neighbours, your friends? How do you speak encouragement into their life and thereby imitate Jesus and share his love and encouraging spirit with the world? We can encourage through words, written or spoken. We can encourage through spending time with people, going to visit them, listening to them. We can encourage by giving financially to them. We can encourage by providing practical support. We can encourage by prayer. We can pick people up like Barnabas did for John Mark when they've fallen down or after they've made mistakes. In fact, after this passage, right at the end of Thessalonians, um, Paul says this, encourage the disheartened. Is anyone around you disheartened? Encourage them. We can support fledgling Christians. We can defend and believe the best about those who have a dubious past, like Barnabas did for when Saul arrived in Jerusalem. We can uh, introduce them and partner with other gospel workers. Um, we can have reconciled broken relationships. John Mark and, and Paul were, were reconciled in the end because of what Barnabas did, how he called the best out of John Mark and John Mark recovered. We can visit the lonely or the isolated. We can send back encouraging reports about how people's faith is going like uh, Timothy did. So what's the atmosphere in our church? Is it an encouraging church? Are we cheering one another on? Are we reminding each other of all that Jesus has done for us? Are you doing it? If you're not, start now. Pick up the phone, write a card, type an email, pen a letter, go and visit someone. Get serious about encouraging others. Why? Well, because encouragement comes from God. Encouragement builds up God's people. And encouragement builds God's kingdom. Do you want to see God's kingdom come in Stamford, in the wider area, in Lincolnshire and beyond? Then encourage. How's it going for you in lockdown? Remember, we don't need to worry. We do not need to be afraid because we have hope in the midst of suffering and persecution. And that hope means that we should encourage one another. I hope you're feeling encouraged. Go get encouraging. Let's pray as we finish. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you are the ultimate model of encouragement, that you call the best things out of us, that you believe in us, that you speak strength and hope into our lives. And we ask that you would help us to model ourselves on you, that we would encourage, we would share the love and encouragement that you brought to us that you would help us to encourage your people and build them up and that we would build your kingdom for your glory. Amen. And now we're going to enjoy um, some songs to help us worship God and uh, reflect on these things uh, performed for us beautifully by Mo and by Lydia. We're going to sing Bind Us Together, Lord, and then we're going to sing The Lion and the Lamb. May God bless you. Bye.
stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that will slay For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Every knee will bow before the Lord. 